Welcome to our friends around the world, to Accurator's solutions to the five most common problems in dental 3D printing. My name is Jacques Strubel, sales manager at Accurator Technologies, and we have a very special program for you today. First, we have Dr. Nakul Rati out of Houston, followed by Dr. Tom Shaw out of Australia, and then a very special guest, Dr. Rick Ferguson, implant educator in the U.S., Many of you know him already from the Facebook group, Dental 3D Printing Group, with over 14,000 members. So if you haven't joined already, please do. There's a lot of good information there. Dr. Rick Ferguson will be going through a guide to creating in-house hybrids. And this will be followed by a Q&A where Dr. Rick Ferguson will join us. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our founder and CEO, Ayush Bagla. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing all today? So I'd like to say um, it's a pleasure to be in front of you all today and talk to you more about the, the five solutions that we've made to common problems in dental 3D printing. So starting off by saying, hey, you know, all of us would like something that works fast. It works accurate. You know, it's affordable. It's easy to use. It's streamlined. And Hey, don't we want all that? However, most of the solutions that we've seen in the market are, don't really have those things. Either they have the accuracy or they have the speed. Usually they don't have both. So, and if they do, they're usually too expensive and out of reach for most of the clients. Now, moving ahead, you know, most of the products don't have the consistent performance that you'd need to basically use it for, um, you know, production type of workflow. And, the other aspect with that is if they could be used, they're not very convenient to be used. And, you know, think about what your time is worth to you. Think about the amount of work that is required to do the calibration. So it's, it's quite a bit actually to take in for an average user uh, who's not very sure about a lot of these things. And um, usually if the products are inconvenient to use, they run into support issues and it may take more than a couple of days to basically fix the support problems and you know get back up and running. And the loss of revenue may be a bit too much for uh, a business to hold. Uh, so considering these four points, there's no streamlined solution that we see currently in the market um, to solve this kind of uh, ecosystem. And now I'd like to talk about the soul and what we've done with it to, to make it uh, solve the problems uh, for the industry. So with the advanced monochrome LCD technology, hey, it's a cool name, I know, uh, but what does it actually do? With that, we're able to increase the speed of the printer uh, by about three times compared to an RGB screen. And um, the durability of the printer is a lot longer because the LCD life is uh, about 10 times more than a traditional uh, LCD that you would find on a printer. Now. Along with the LCD, we need a really good backlight uh, technology to go with it, which is something we've made. And we have over 95% uniformity in our backlight technology. All this is cool and, you know, it's a lot of terms and a lot of technical details. But what does it mean for you, who's the user? Very simple. You could produce a full arch case within 35 to 45 minutes consistently, accurately and reliably. So... A um, few more points that I'd like to talk about with the Soul is that you have a plug-and-play zero calibration system. And with a plug-and-play zero calibration system, 
basically you don't have to calibrate the z-axis you don't have to calibrate the resins it's pretty much pour and print so it's as easy as that and you know um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the Alpha 3D software. So in the Alpha 3D software that we have over here, we have application specific workflows. And using those application specific workflows, we are basically able to design a full arch case, for example, in under one minute. And that makes it really easy for any new user to jump into 3D printing, uh, especially with this software. Now to guide people on that process, we have more than 25 tutorial and operational videos to help customers actually use the product. And uh, the product's available in nine languages, so uh, pretty much a global audience could use it plug and play without having to worry about what they're doing with it, right? So as I touched upon a bit earlier uh, with the support and you know, to get tech support and to solve certain problems, it may take a couple of days uh, to get answers and figure out what the issue is. However, with the Soul, we're able to uh, produce a remote diagnostic system inside the machine, which basically detects what the issue is uh, and tells us, you know, how we can go about solving it. Um, okay, excellent. So to follow up from here, I would like to talk about the materials that we've uh, calibrated with the system. We have over a hundred biocompatible materials that are already pre-calibrated with the soul. So imagine how much time it would take an end user like yourself to calibrate those materials on your own from industry leaders like Keystone, like Dentona, like Bago. The possibilities are unimaginable because today with this package, you're able to plug and play over a hundred materials from these companies uh, without any effort. So it's, it's really as easy as that. So, you know, now I'd like to talk about Dr. Nakul Radi. We had the pleasure of meeting him in Houston earlier this year from Easy Dental Clinic and, you know, Easy Dental Implants is the name of his company. You must check him out on social media and uh, his Facebook page to see what he's doing. A real thought leader in the space of uh, implantology and uh, dentures. He's a prosthodontist by profession. So, um, you know, uh, he, he's going to touch base on what we did with the soul in his clinic as we performed two full arch cases in one day. And I'll let him, um, you know, give his impressions on that. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Nakul Rati. I'm a prosthodontist here in Houston. And uh, I want to thank uh, Ayush and his team today. Uh, they came uh, to our office, Easy Dental, and we had the chance to play with this uh, new toy, the Soul. Uh, uh, we did two full arch cases today and uh, got the guides printed, uh, really nice clear material, and then did the guided surgery, fabricated printed prosthesis and delivered it on the same day. So uh, exciting new machine. Uh, we have a lot of printers in our office and uh, this one would probably be a great addition to our our uh, our workhorse it it was very predictable the print was less than an hour for the prosthesis less than an hour for the uh, guide so something which would turn our same day dentistry protocol uh, really efficiently so thank you thank you team Akira for being here Super, I'm glad you, you enjoyed watching those things. So, you know, let me ask you all a question. Like he said, the product's really accurate. It's really fast. How did we get there? What did Accurata do? So here I would like to introduce a bit of a technology that we created in-house at Accurata after years and years of R&D, which we proudly call the dynamic optical engine. And essentially with the dynamic optical engine, a regular 3D printer, has a light distribution that's uh, very wide and um, it's illuminating light in areas across the build platform where you, even you're not printing. And because of that, we're gonna have um, curing, a little bit of curing in certain places where you don't want it to cure. And with the soul, we're having something that can cure only in some specific areas where you basically um, needed to cure. So 
uh, it's much easier with this to ensure that your prints are more consistent and your life of your printer is a lot higher. Super. So I'd like to talk about Dr. Tom Shao, our friend from Down Under. And uh, he's basically been, um, you know, using the sole to produce full mouth cases. And uh, he's done a great job with um, the product. And I'd like you to hear about his impressions and what it's done for him and his business. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Tom Shao. I'm from the Gold Coast in Australia. Today, I'd just like to share with you guys my experience so far with the Accurate Soul 3D printer. So I received probably the first unit in Australia about five weeks ago. Um, the day that um, we received the unit, we were quite excited to get our hands on it. We previously had some really good experiences with Authentic and the Soul promises to be better. So. My nurses unpacked the uh, printer and uh, to test the nature of the claim of the printer being a plug and play unit, we decided to, without doing anything else, uh, just to mount one of our um, existing dental models that we designed uh, straight into the printer and see how it goes. And what do you know, it printed flawlessly. So within um, 10 minutes of receiving the package, we started our first kind of successful print. So that was pretty impressive. Normally, um, you know, there's a bunch of calibrations you've got to do with a new unit or a bunch of screws you've got to tighten and fine tune. Um, none of that with the sole, which kind of surprised me. In terms of speed of print, the sole easily compares with the best of them. Um, it's probably comparable to something that you might know, the Asiga. Um, the quality of print is also excellent. It's probably amongst the best um, the best quality and precise prints I've seen. So the difference between the Soul versus some of the other printers, uh, you might ask. The user interface is quite a modern, intuitive user interface. It's a very user-friendly system. Um, it, it is truly plug and play, even for a novice uh, user. Um, I would feel quite comfortable recommending that uh, product to a, a novice user. We all know we as dental professionals, um, time's valuable to us. So what is really important to me when I'm recommending a printer is how predictable can the technology be? I don't want some, someone with limited technology to spend their weekend tinkering with the hardware. Um, just to get something printed successfully. And, and I think the Soul is probably one of the easiest printers to get working predictably. So that's a big plus for me. Um, My findings of the Soul so far is bulletproof. I don't remember, and I'm pretty sure we haven't had a single failed print. Um, and we use this thing every day. Excellent. So you see at Accurata, we don't just sell printers. Uh, we are a solutions company that has a complete ecosystem of solutions like you see here, starting from the Alpha 3D to the printers, to the uh, resins, the cleaning unit and the curing unit. And with this entire eco solution, ecosystem that fits in one table over here, we're able to actually perform same day dentistry of not the future anymore, but the present. And we're able to actually use those things to uh, produce all these lovely applications. And I would now hand it over to Dr. Rick Ferguson, who is one of the most respected names in the world of digital dentistry, who's the founder of the Dental 3D Printing Group on Facebook. Um, and uh, he would give you his impressions of how he's used the soul and his workflow to create you know, a game-changing uh, performance for um, his uh, patients. And after that, I would love to welcome all of you to our Q&A. Please feel free to write in and, you know, we're going to work through that and answer your questions as best as possible. And um, yeah, I hand it over to Rick.
testing 3D printers for accuracy, um, I use a standard temporary hybrid uh, that I have designed using ExoCAD. So in this case, um, we're designing a, a hybrid um, using a stone model that was produced from a standard open tray impression technique. And the scan bodies are actually the cover caps for the multi-unit abutments. So we scan the multi-unit abutments and then design the temporary hybrid um, in ExaCAD. And then we can export that file and print it on a 3D printer. And then in this particular case, we are actually designing it so that it goes directly to the multi-unit abutments, which eliminates the intermediary tie bases. Um, we can check the fit of the, uh, the hybrid by screwing it directly to the stone model, which was our original reference stone model. So you can see here, everything's been designed. This is the green file, which you see here on the screen now is the uh, final design that's going to be exported as an STL file. And we will print this on the Accurator sole and check the fit of this prosthesis on the reference stone model. We're now gonna look at the Alpha 3D software. This is a slicing software that comes with the Accurator sole. Uh, the first step in is to open the software and then just basically drag and drop the model over onto the build platform as depicted in the software. So we're going to position the model um, and it's important that we position the model uh, that it, so that it will print with the highest level of accuracy, which in my opinion means rotating the model so that the surface that we want with the highest level of accuracy, which in this case is the areas that are going to attach to the multi-unit abutments, is actually going to be printing uh, upright. In other words, um, they're at the top of the image as it looks here in the software. It's actually going to be printed upside down. So it'll, it's actually going to be the bottom of the model. The next thing we're going to do is choose the quality or the layer thickness. Um, and in this case, we're going to choose a layer thickness of 0.1 millimeters. There's no reason to print at a higher resolution than this for a temporary hybrid. So this is considered uh, in the software standard. So we'll choose a standard mode here and then we'll have to do the supports. One of the great things about the Alpha 3D software is that it's so easy to uh, add the supports. Now there are gonna be some manual changes that I'll make, but in essence, there are presets for the different types of, the, of uh, dental appliances. You can see here the, the supports have been added. One thing we'll wanna do is edit the location of the supports, although the software is smart enough to add the supports, it's not smart enough to know what actual type of model you have based on your individual model. So we're going to look at this by clicking on the manual tab to change the manual position of the supports. And what we're gonna do here is actually delete any of the support points that are going to attach within the screw access holes. We want those screw access holes to have a very high level of accuracy with printing and the support structures are gonna add little nubs to those areas. So we actually wanna delete those. So we're done with the manual adjustments and we're now going to do our slicing So we're going to go ahead and slice. And once uh, the slicing is complete, the software is going to save that on your computer. It's going to save the slice file. So once that's, that slicing is done and it saves the slice file, uh, we can then send it to the printer. So you can see the slicing process happening right now. Is, this usually doesn't take very long. So one of the nice things about the Accurate Soul is that it's pretty much a plug and play printer. To start to print, you make sure that the build platform is secure, 
fill the resin tank with the resin that you want to print the model in. In this case, we're printing a temporary hybrid using Nextend MFH temporary uh, resin. So we're going to fill that to the fill line. There's actually a measurement line in the tank itself, depending on how much uh, or how large the, the model you're printing. You, there are two different uh, lines. And then we're just going to hit the file name on the touch screen, which has been transferred over to Wi-Fi from the Alpha 3D software to the printer. Here we'll see a little bit of a closer view of that touch screen. We see the file name there in the queue. We hit print. Uh, it'll show you a visual representation of the model, and then you can just start to print from there. And of course, it can ask you also to verify the print. This particular model uh, took about 40 minutes to print, and you can see the printer is going to start. Now, typically, you wouldn't have the the um, cover open like this, but for this time lapse video. I left it open so we could see the printer in motion. So the, the platform's not going to be moving up and down quite as fast as you see in this video. This is sped up, I believe, 20 times normal speed. So as I was saying about the printer, it's a pretty straightforward, easy to use printer. Comes uh, pre-calibrated. Do have to put the tank in and the build platform. But once those are in and you plug the printer in, connect it to your Wi-Fi, it's pretty much ready to go. Um, the resins are pre-calibrated by Accuretta, so there's no resin calibration that needs to be done also. And it's a pretty fast printer. One of the wonderful things about this printer is that it is great for same-day uh, prosthesis. So, for example, in a case where we're doing an all-on-X situation where we're putting in, you know, four, five, six implants and... Once the implants go in, we can actually scan the patient using photogrammetry or an intraoral scanner. Not as accurate as photogrammetry, but there are ways to get around that. And if we have the file or the prosthesis already designed, we can transfer the positions of the new implants into that file in Exacad from the scans, uh, the post implant placement scans and then uh, fit the tie, the uh, either tie bases, or in this case, we're going direct to MUAs, but we can fit um, the, the prosthesis directly to the implants now um, using Exocad or some other similar software, um, and then output an STL file that we, we can print on the sole in less than an hour, do our post-processing, staining, etc., and have that uh, process is ready for delivery same day. So here you can see the printer is finished printing. Again, it wouldn't be printing this fast. This is again a time lapse video. But once this is done, we can remove it from the build platform, do the post processing, and deliver this hybrid to the patient. This can be done also for temporary crown and bridges, etc. So that's one of the beautiful things about this printer is the speed. Now that the print is complete, we can remove the build platform by unscrewing the build platform screw and inspecting the print to make sure that everything is there. We're ready now for post-processing. Welcome back, everyone. So we want to thank Dr. Rati, Dr. Shao, and Dr. Ferguson for those wonderful presentations. 
And thank you, Ayush, for your presentation as well. We remind everyone to please get some questions in on the live storm platform and uh, we'll get to those questions. So uh, we're very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Rick Ferguson live. So please have some questions for Dr. Ferguson. I'll start things off with a question for Dr. Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson, can you hear me? Oh, I don't think we can. some technical issues there. Uh, check, check the microphone. <laughs> okay. You should be able to hear me now. There we go. We got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for oh. having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. First question for you. Um, two part question. Number one, where do you see the gaps in the market for digital dentistry? And part two of that question is where do you see the clinical side of this in the next three years? So as far as gaps, um, right now, I think the only, you know, we're using 3D printing and digital dentistry pretty much for everything in our, in our clinical practice, um, except for removable prosthodontics. And, um, you know, even there, we are using digital dentistry, but typically we're doing conventional impressions um, and then scanning those uh, sometimes even pouring stone models still. So that's the big gap right now. But however, as a matter of fact, I posted a case on Monday where we did an immediate extraction case with full arch, uh, full arch extraction and immediate dentures, which were 3D printed. Um, uh, the teeth actually on that case we were printed on the accurate assault. So even in the, uh, situations, like, situations like that, we're doing sort of a hybrid model where we are uh, using conventional impressions, but digitizing them. But to go fully digital, I think in the next three years, to answer the question, I think we will have more advances in the data acquisition. We're already there as far as once the data is, um, is gathered, the, the, the planning and processing, and then going back to what I call going from a real patient to a virtual reality situation, and then going back to reality now with the the final prosthesis or the temporary prosthesis. That's how you bring it back from the virtual world into the real world. I think those advances will continue, although I think for the most part, we are there already. The, the only, only other thing I can see that we can improve on is the strength of the material, the 3D printed materials. And I understand those advances are coming also. Okay, super. So you definitely see the trend from labs to clinical continuing. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, what a lot of folks are doing now is outsourcing the design. So there, there's some very good labs around the world where you can um, gather the data set, send it to them, and uh, they can do the planning and then sending you back the, the, the STL files to be printed which frees up a lot of the time for yourself or the clinician and the assistants, but also not just the time that we were spending planning and designing, but also the time that we were taking to go to CE courses to learn these things. Even though I am <laughs> one of those people who teaches those CE courses, I think in that respect also, you'll see a hybrid model because there are some things that are done quickly in the software that can easily be done by your assistants. Our assistants are doing a lot of it now in our clinical practice. But then the more advanced things, you will still have the need for a digital lab. Okay, good. Well, we hope the trend continues. The, the soul is really aimed at the clinical market. So at this point, we'd like to open up the platform, see if there's any more questions from our friends around the world. Yes, we have a question. We do have a question from Just. Uh, he's asking, you can change uh, support settings easily. How easy is it to change the support settings? Okay, I'll uh, give that one to you. 
Well, uh, the support settings are very easy to change. Um, and what we've done at Accureta's Alpha 3D software is the most streamlined solution in the market because based on every application, we've created support parameters for those specific indications. Therefore, the user doesn't need to second guess or try and um, think about, okay, you know, is it 0.6 mm, is it 0.8 mm? Uh, those decisions are taken for them by the presets that we've made in the software. And uh, for a dentist, we would believe this is really critical because they don't want to know that information to begin with. All right, that's a good one. There's uh, another question for, this one is for Dr. Ferguson, also by job, by jobs. He's asking, in your opinion, Dr. Ferguson, um, how intuitive is Alpha 3D software? So, uh, like any software, there is a learning curve with everything, right? And there is a term that we use, you know, in, in uh, technology is that the more complex, the more powerful something is, the more complex it tends to be. So, what's great about Alpha 3D is that it can be as simple as you want it, right? But then you also have the ability to get into the system and change the parameters as well, uh, which is nice. Um, the, probably the only thing you cannot change is actual resins. The resins are pre-calibrated by the company, and there's a huge advantage in that, in that the accuracy will be there for you. But if you want to change the, the parameters as far as the slicing settings or the support settings, that's definitely something you can tinker with. But as far as the ease of use of the software, it's very simple. You know, I went through a workflow in the in the video you just saw, which was pretty easy to do. And you know, there is one aspect that I that I think the AI artificial intelligence will uh, help with as time goes by. We're not quite there yet, which is identifying which areas of the model that you do not want support structures on. So right now, I think that's the only part that you really have to tinker with. And that comes from your clinical knowledge uh, and, and the, depending on the prosthesis. Thank you. I have a question just going off of that uh, idea about the users not being able to change settings. Ayush, why did we engineer the software that way? Uh, good question. So with um, RGB LCD screen or one of the slower LCD printers, it is less technique sensitive. Therefore, uh, if a curing time was 10 seconds and we made it 11 seconds, uh, the inaccuracy of that one second wouldn't have a major impact on the print performance. However, with something like the Soul, the power is about five times more than those uh, RGB screens. Therefore, if the variation from the ideal curing time is even in two seconds, the accuracy would be quite adversely affected. And uh, that's not something an end user could very easily do, uh, considering it requires tools and a lot of experience to fine tune it to that level. Therefore, um, you know, we believe that the dentists make more money in the patient's mouth than outside the patient's mouth. And it's probably better that it's done by the engineers here at Accureta. All right. Uh, thank you, Ayush. Do we have any more questions from the live storm? Sure. We have uh, one question. This one is from James Babin. Um, he's asking, uh, is there any reference in printing from the entire side versus the lateral side of the object? Any reference in printing from the entire side versus the palatal side of the object? That's the question I'm getting. Okay, very technical. Ayush, did you did you get that? <laughs> I think this is a better question for Dr. Rick Ferguson. Do, Dr. Ferguson, did you catch that question? Um, not not fully, but I can oh. I can uh, give an answer based on what I think they're asking, which is okay, the accuracy you. of the intaglio side versus the uh, let's say you have a surgical guide, right? Um, what you want with a surgical guide, for example, is to have the intaglio side be as accurate as possible, right? However, on the opposing side, 
of a surgical guide, you're going to have guide uh, the places where the guide tubes or guide or guide sleeve the metal sleeves are going to seat. Or if you're doing a sleeveless type of guide, where the actual drill is going to seat. So what you want is a combination of accuracy on both sides. And in order to do that uh, on a LCD type printer, um, and most 3D printers, frankly, is you're going to have to angle the print in such a way that you can get accuracy on both sides. There will always be a sacrifice of accuracy on the part that's going to be touching the, the film as the printer, you know, builds the, the model in slices, um, you're going to have pull forces that are going to affect that. So what you try to do is, is eliminate or minimize those areas and position the model in such a way that um, you, it, you know, the parts that need the accuracy are going to be at an angle. In other words, if you have a, a long flat area, those tend not to print very accurately if they're horizontal to the, the bill platform. And that's what you're trying. We that's what we teach in our courses is to angle the model so that you can get accuracy on both sides. For example, if you're printing a denture, a denture needs accuracy on the intaglio side as far as the denture base, and we typically print the denture base separate from the teeth. So you'll print the denture base with sockets on one side that the teeth will fit into, and then on the intaglio surface, that part needs to be printed accurately so that it'll have a good fit in the patient's mouth. So typically we're printing those almost vertically. And what you'll have is a slight inaccuracy right at the rim uh, of the denture where it's not that important where you can just polish that out. And that's how we tend to, to build things. So you do have to have a knowledge of the type of model that you're printing and how to position it on the build platform. Yeah. Now, uh, over time I have noticed that uh, as the printers have become more accurate. And also it has to do with the speed of the printer. Uh, it increases the, the speed when you uh, increase the, the optics and so on that Ayush has talked about. But what I've seen is that we're able to print more accurately now, even with smaller supports as the technology has improved, which means you can actually get better accuracy, um, even if the model is not completely uh, you know, in the right position. So that's where having the built-in uh, support structures, the built-in settings for the support structures based on your type of model comes in as well. Thank you. So I Dr. hope I Bruce. got the gist of that question and I answered it. Yep, I think uh, you got uh, most of it there. Um, so any more questions from? There's, There's one, one more question, question. from um, Nakurai. Hi, Dr. Ferguson. Um, which healing equipment scan body system was used in the case that you share? Could you repeat that question for me? I got some echoing, so I couldn't hear the question. Sure. Uh, the question uh, that Naku Rady is asking for you today is which uh, healing equipment scan body system was used in this case that you shared with us today? Oh, okay. So that happened to be a BioHorizons uh, uh, implant. So in the BioHorizons system, the um, cover cap, the multi-unit cover cap is actually the, um, the scan body. Now that's if you're using intraoral scanning. Actually, what we're using today is photogrammetry. So with photogrammetry systems, the scan, we use what are called scan flags instead of scan bodies. But you can get a fairly accurate scan using scan bodies if you take a conventional impression and then pour a stone model, right? But if you're going directly in the mouth, the recommendation right now is to use, is, is use photogrammetry. Um, you could take an impression also and use that as well and scan an impression, but it's not so much the the, the actual impression in the mouth or the scanning in the mouth, it's the technology of using an intraoral scanner, which is using stitching of images across the arch. The, the precision on each scan body will be good, but across the arch, you're gonna get an inherent distortion. So in the, just to uh, more precisely answer the question, yes, we're using in that case, 
uh, by Horizon's um, cover caps as scan bodies, but it was done on a stone model, not directly in the mouth. When we are doing cases now directly in the mouth, we're using photogrammetry, which is uh, basically system independent as far as the, um, the scan bodies themselves or the, or the scan flags themselves, because pretty much all the, the multi-unit abutments are, are very similar. And that's something that the photogrammetry manufacturer, whatever, whichever system you buy, will have the libraries in their software. Do we have any more? We have, we have one more question here. Again, from Knuckle Writing. Mm -hmm. um, he's asking, what are your material option for these interim processes currently that you uh, currently would solve? which are USD um, FDA approved. I think that's for you guys. What are your material options for these interim processes currently that uh, currently with Sol, which are US FDA approved? Ah. cases with him, uh, we are undergoing a validation with uh, Nixon for the class 2 MFH. The other one is for Bamo. Uh, we just uh, announced something where we completely validated with their uh, smile plus and crown uh, material. So I think all those are very good options uh, for uh, these kind of cases. Good. The next question we have um, from Chris Aldrist uh, to Dr. Ferguson. Uh, which material do you use to print the attempts that can be seen in an X-ray to confirm the fit of all the on the X case? Um, okay, so right now we're using uh, Nextend MFH material. You can see it on an X-ray, right? However, um, it doesn't. It's certainly not as clear as what you would get with a tie base. So, if you absolutely need to confirm the fit on an X-ray, I would recommend using a tie base. Now, keep in mind that when we're using these temporaries, we are typically doing them same day, so the implants are not actually integrated. All right, so I'm actually not that concerned about the fit, although we are getting a very accurate fit. Um, you know, I have posted images on in the in the 3D printing group showing the accuracy of the fit, but the implants are actually not integrated yet, so it's not, in my opinion, that important that the fit be as perfect as if uh, as if uh, the implants are integrated. So after about four or five months. Um, once the implants are integrated, that's when you really need a precision fit. Now, of course, you don't want it to be sloppy, you know, so um, we will check visually because we're using multi-unit abutments. We will select multi-unit abutments that bring everything uh, super, super gingivally. So you can visualize and see the fit um, visually. We're typically not taking x-rays to check our fit. Uh, I think that's really not necessary if you use the right multi-unit abutments and bring uh, the, the prosthesis or the fit of the prosthesis above the tissue, okay? But you're working in a surgical environment. If you really need to, you can visualize it. I, you know, later on when we are doing the final impressions, Yes, we're gonna. You're gonna typically be using zirconia, which will show up radiographically, and you can check the fit there. But even then, what we teach in our, what I've been teaching for several decades now, is actually to use 
um, transmucosal abutments, in this case, multi-unit abutments, to bring everything super gingival. And I don't believe x-rays are even that great for checking the fit. The x-ray beam has to be completely perpendicular to the margin and, or, or sorry, uh, parallel to the, to the margin for it to give you an accurate reading anyways. So, I mean, we all know that from, you know, basic implantology concepts. So I always try to use transmucosal abutments and the fit of the prostheses is checked visually in the mouth. But again, surgically, I don't think it has to be exactly perfect as long as the structure is rigid across the arch. Dr. Ferguson, you mentioned the next time. So I have a question for you. Is the soul calibrated, validated the next time? Um, it's calibrated at the moment, and it is currently undergoing validation at uh, next time accordingly. So that would follow through really soon. Um, in our validation protocol, it's not just about making certain settings but it's about getting the products listed with the FDA and uh, with the CD and the order uh, to ensure that um, it undergoes all the testing for the entire workflow, the printer and the UV box. So, uh, so I use this time. So I use this. All right. All right. We have the next, the next question, question for you guys. guys. Um, from Jobs. Jobs. Do dentists need the service from a lab, or can you do most of the work in in-house uh, due to 3D printing? Uh, well, um, I think both options are available. That you know, a dentist uh, could use the lab as a service, or they could um, try and design the prosthesis themselves. So, for example, uh, something like a splint now has become really easy to uh, design in-house. Um, Dr. Ferguson's been very kind to use the Team 3D Sprint tool to educate people about how easy it can be to do a split. However, of course, for more complicated cases, it's better to use a design service. So, uh, just to go off that, we are integrating the, our Alpha 3D software into many of the intro-all scanning options, like the Edit feature, uh, Sky, etc. So, there is this integration of the whole ecosystem to make the whole workflow. All right, next question uh, from Jonathan Thompson. In what situation would, would 3D printing be preferable to a meal and vice versa? Preferable to a? To a meal. To a meal. Uh, well, what I could say is that, um, you know, if it's an apple and orange type of situation, it depends on what one is making. Uh, today, to produce models, the printer is better to produce a surgically dye. Uh, the printer is uh, better now. When it comes to a permanent crown, um, I still believe the quality of the zirconia crown is far superior to anything uh, that is printable today, even in ceramics or in uh, hybrid polymer. Therefore, um, I think the mill is always going to shine uh, with the ceramics, and printers uh, will probably not reach the same level as the mill. So, as far as permanent crowns do go, what are the two main resins that can achieve permanent crowns currently? So, currently in the market, we've observed two specific brands that have a permanent restorative material. Uh, one of them is Dago. They are the only one with the FDA 510K uh, validated workflow. And the second material is from Saremco uh, from Switzerland. Uh, the product is uh, validated in Europe. It's not yet validated in the US, but that's going to be done by Q1 next year. Uh, so, yeah, I would say your choice is between one of those two. Good. The next question is from Richard Sanchez. He's asking, uh, what labs would you recommend for design? If you know of labs that you would recommend for design. There are a couple of design centers. I, I will mention a few, and then I'd call on Dr. Ferguson to mention a few. Uh, I know this evident uh, company out in uh, North America, and of course, the School Contour, uh, they are from the Three Shape Group. So I would recommend one of these two companies uh, to provide you a wide variety of services. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, have you seen something else that you would recommend? So you mentioned uh, a few already, which I uh, wholeheartedly agree with, 
And then there is also Evolve in Buff out of Buffalo, New York, which is a very good lab. Josh Jackson uh, there is very, very helpful as well. Just a real powerhouse as far as, uh, you know, somebody who's who understands digital dentistry, understands the software, and just a very, very good person, very helpful. So Evolve Lab out of Buffalo, New York is also very good with design. Excellent. Next question, please. Keep them coming. <laughs> Next question. Um, it's from Jobst. Just one second. He's asking, you were talking about the learning curve. How long does it take or how many times have you had to print until you're happy with the printer result? So one of our main goals is to, to really have a true plug and play form print printer out of the box. This is our sort of holy grail, our mission, our target. You'll be happy if the person takes it out of the box, pushes a few buttons, and it prints. Of course, it doesn't always happen, so that there is training available at any time, and it really depends on the user's experience. Have they been experiencing the three printing before, or are they completely new? Uh, what type of applications are they printing? So there's quite a few variables that go into that. We do find some users that first time they take it out of the box and they're good to go. But uh, you know, there are different situations, and uh, it's always training available. Good. The next question is from Aniraj Sura. Um, he's, he's asking, asking any advice on how to store resins, resins for example? example? If, if we, we have, have a resin in one bat and need to swap resins and therefore use another bat, what do you recommend how to handle? I think uh, Dr. Ferguson can answer that better than anybody else. Yeah, I'll be happy to answer that. I think the best thing to do is to buy um, additional uh, vats or the tank. Um, so what you want to do is, uh, you know, have extra tanks so you don't actually have to swap out the resin. It's a small price to pay, in my opinion, because cleaning a tank is not is not uh, a lot of fun. So what we do is we have a cabinet uh, that we can store the vats so that uh, they don't have exposure to light. Okay, and there are some resins that you will that I do recommend you pour the, the resin back into the bottle through a filter, such as the Nextent MFH resin. I would not recommend you leave that one in the vat. However, that's it's not difficult to pour the resin into back into the bottle, but cleaning the tank is a problem. So even if you're going to pour out the resin, I recommend you just keep one tank for each type of resin. And then it's a very simple thing to change out the tank, uh, especially in the Accurata. There are no screws to unscrew to change the tank. It's just two little clips that you flip up. The tank comes out. You put in a new tank and pour your resin and you're ready to go. So the cleaning of the tank is the problem, not necessarily pouring the resin out. That's pretty easy to do. And uh, the rule that I have is if a, if a resin has... Um, a color in it. In other words, if it has uh, pigments in it, that's the type of resin you don't want to leave in the tank. If a resin is clear, such as surgical guide resin, I find that you can leave that in there without having to remix it or anything like that. But the ones with the pigments, the pigments tend to settle out. So those we recommend you not leave in the tank for more than more than a day or so. Pour those back into the bottle uh, through a filter, and then. Um, you know, when you're ready to go again, you just pour it back into the tank. But stick with one tank for each resin. That makes your life so much easier. Good. Uh, we have another question. Is it possible to reuse um, resin that was left after printing um, the model? Yeah. 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 All right. If what I can add to that, yeah, if I can add to that, um, I would follow the manufacturer's recommendations on the resin, okay? Yeah. Now, it's something that we do routinely where we reuse the resin that was already in the tank, and we haven't found it to be a problem, but I would uh, consult with the manufacturer's recommendations on that, okay? 
right. The next question is, um, what is the estimated maximum working hours of the LSD for the soul? Yeah, that's an easy one. The, L the LCD panel is up to 10,000 hours. What is the material used for a permanent crown? Uh, okay, so we did talk about that a few minutes ago. Permanent crown is two resins, Bago and Ceramco. Um, but the material that's used uh, inside it is usually uh, something to do with a polymer and a ceramic hybrid. Now, ceramic is what they use as a filler, and the percentage uh, of the filler that's used in the material uh, on these two specific materials that have their validations um, is between 30 to 50 percent of filler and uh, 50 to 70 percent of polymer. Uh, therefore, it's a lot easier to print with those rather than the pure ceramic resins, which have over 60 or 70 percent amount of filler. Um, and it's the filler and the binding of the filler that provides the strength for a permanent material. Is it possible to request a calibration for a resin that, that, that they need to use? Yes, we do have this uh, available, although we want to strictly control the quality of the ecosystem. So uh, it's a lot of work going through the correct uh, validated pr procedure protocols. So we don't want to just add any old resin off the street onto the ecosystem. There's patient safety, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. So we continue to work with the best material companies in the world, as you've heard, next step, Jago and Stone, and many others. Um, if there is a, a case to be made for another resin, we will take it into consideration. We will add it to the ecosystem. Um, what is the difference between Dentic and Sol? We have a slide that sums it up quite nicely. Uh, but essentially, the Dentic is our entry level product. It's the color LCD. So it is a little bit slower. The build platform is a little bit slower smaller than the sole. The sole is our premium uh, printer, which is uh, faster, larger build platform, and uh, the resolution of both of them is about the same, just as good. There's nothing wrong with the Dentic. It's a perfectly good machine, well engineered. It's just that the one is entry level, the sole is the premium. Good. Um what is the influence of post curing on final part properties like dimension, mechanical properties, and color? Uh, well, actually, the post curing is very important. It's even more important than uh, the printing process because only 20% of the curing actually occurs on the printer, and 80% occurs in the post cure process. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, just by that number. The mechanical properties and the biological properties, uh, whether it's cytotoxicity, it's irritation, um, and uh, in class two materials, it would do uh, ribbon animal testing, uh, are only validated with the uh, post cure process. So, uh, post cure process is not given the importance that it usually deserves, but uh, I would say extremely important. So, I think Dr. Ferguson will be taking up a lot of your time. We you know you're a busy man. So, we want to thank you one more time for uh, joining us for the live QA session. It, it's been my pleasure, and thank you again for the opportunity uh, to be a part of this. Um, I will let folks know that if they'd like to reach out to me, my email address is drferguson at aol.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson, and thank you everybody for joining us. We hope to see you for the next webinar. So take care. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, guys.